Welcome back to an edition of Real Conversations, where it's my pleasure to have Professor Steve Hankey from Johns Hopkins University join me to talk about everything from central planning to foreign currencies to what's going to happen next, potentially. There's a lot to obviously go through. Uh, Steve, thanks for taking the time to do this. I appreciate it. Great to be with you, Keith. So the first thing I want to kind of go through top down is your view of economics, trying to give people a baseline, just kind of a primer on how you think of applied economics relative to maybe some of the Keynesians out there and how they think about central planning. Well, I, I think the main thing is that money matters and, and money dominates. And, and so that puts you, uh, or at least me, in, in kind of the monetarist sphere, shall we say. And, and I think the easiest way to think about this, Keith, think about uh, you know, the fiscalists, of course, or modern Keynesians always are in the let's stimulate fiscal policy and that's going to boost the economy and get things going and keep it on an even keel and so forth. And since the crisis, the money supply broadly measured, broadly measured, we're talking about M4 now and you can get this at the Center for Financial Stability in New York, M4, the, the broadest measure is what you need and, and that, in what they term the Divisia M4 measure, is only growing now at about 2.5% year over year. Very slow growth, very slow growth. And the reason the economy is growing more slowly than most people think, if you look at final sales to domestic purchasers, that, that's a good proxy for aggregate demand in the economy. And you measure it in nominal terms, it's only growing at 3.9%, which is up a little bit, actually. It has gotten a little stronger. <laughs> it has gotten a little stronger, but the trend rate of that since 1987 is 5%. So we're, we're still in the midst of a recession or a slump. We have never come out of it after the Lehman collapse. So from 2009 until now we've been in a slump. We're in a growth recession. It's not going to get any better fast because money dominates, money matters, and it, money is not growing. And, and there are two components to, to the broad measure of the money supply. One is called state money. The, the Keynes uh, outlined this division, by the way, and, and very clearly in, in the treatise, with his two-volume 1930 publication, which is probably Keynes's best piece of work, in my opinion. And and so you have state money. That's that's what the Fed produces. That's what the ECB uh, produces. Central banks produce state money. Yep. Now, state money, in, in the grand scheme of things, Keith is peanuts. State money is it only amounts to about 20% of the broad money measure in the United States. 80% is made up of what's called bank money, and that's demand deposits and liabilities of banks, commercial banks, 80%. Mm -hmm. So we have a policy of what? We, we have put in Basel III, that's a, a, a regulating the capital asset ratios of banks. We, we've ramped that up. We have new liquidity ratios. We have all kinds of regulations coming out of Basel. We also have Dodd-Frank coming out of the United States. That's a financial regulation, regulations hitting banks. We also have, in general, the political popularity of beating up on bankers in general. <laughs> and, and we ha also have just the supervision, the supervisors and ex bank examiners that are working for the government and applying the, the regular old-fashioned rules are tougher in a time of crisis than they are in, in a, other boom times, shall we say. So all of those things are squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Very tight monetary policy is being imposed on banks, and banks are the big elephant in the room. They produce 80% of the money. I mean, really, to so you have a very this is that. You got money, uh, state money is 20%, bank money is 80%, you're regulating the 80%, and you're trying to 
provide some kind of voodoo or communication tool on the 20%. Is that, that kind of where you wash out on this? Well, yeah, I, 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 you, you are trying to do that. And, and what they've done, you see, the, the, the officials, the authorities, on, are, are totally schizophrenic because they, they just don't understand, I think, is a big problem. And that is you, you squeeze the 80%, the elephant in the room, as tight as you possibly can so that, so that the bank money in the economy now, Keith, is actually less than it was at the time Lehman Yeah, it's interesting when you, because you're looking at M4 when you call money, you know, it's actually less is what you're saying. Right. Yeah, and it, it like if you look at even uh, even in the most recent um, earnings season, which is just as of today, basically, with Bank of America and J.P. Morgan, they're actually seeing a reduction in loan growth, and that's like two of the big places that was you know, were supposed to be the providers of lending and whatnot. Um, so so you get you, the the three components that uh, you you've got interbank lending has is, is disappeared. It's been destroyed. So that's 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 gone. You've got mortgage lending that that is is has not increased since Lehman. And you've got uh, commercial loans and leases which have gone up very very small. If you add it all together, it's smaller than it was at the time when Lehman went down. So 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 this just to jump ahead here, Keith. So, so the Fed, on, on the one hand, they have all these tight bank regulations and, the, and bank money shrinking. So they, they create a big problem. And to correct the problem, they do what? They quantitative ease. They, they have to try to offset the thing. If we hadn't had quantitative easing, it, it, the, the, the problems they created in the bank money sector would have, would have been a complete fiasco and disaster. We'd be in a recession, just like Europe, because Europe, by the way, has not been in quantitative easing mode mm -hmm. at the ECB. And, and, and their banks have been deleveraging. The, the, the money supply isn't growing in, in the European, uh, in, in the Eurozone. And of course, they're on the verge of recession again. Not surprising. And not surprising to me that the U.S. is, is really struggling. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody at this point. You're uh, what's, what's actually quite surprising is, is watching kind of the revisionist economists out there suggest that this time is going to be different. That's basically what you have to say. If, if you see us going down that path, that Japanese path, as you appropriately point out, I can't count the amount of investors I meet with that talk about the next central plan, whether that be a fiscal or a monetary one. And I keep you know, reiterating, do you think that this time is going to be different? And it's kind of implied in the expectation. So what do you think about that, the, the asset side of this? Because you're basically saying, look, money's a lot tighter than you think because banks, 80% uh, of money is tight. You know, it's regulated on an increasing basis. So what do you think about the price or the, a the levitation or the asset price bubble, as I would call it, uh, of this equation in markets? Well, the, the quantitative easing, it, it's, it's, it's gone into the, the stock market to a large extent. That's why we, we have had and we still are technically in a bull market in the stock market. Mm -hmm. So that those... Those asset prices have gone up. That 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 price index, whether it's the S and P 500 or Dow, you you name it, has gone up rather dramatically relative to the CPI, for example, which, which is har hardly moving up at all, or, or, or commodity like, uh, GDP, com <laughs> or, yeah, or, or like or like not yeah, not nominal GDP or nominal sales to final. Purchasers, as I mentioned earlier, that that's 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 slumping. You see, so uh, it, the 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 QE that state money has gone someplace. It's gone in the stock markets, but the but the big thing is the carry trade, because and the carry trade is simply the interest rates have been pushed down to about zero in the United States as part of the QE uh, program. And so you you borrow in dollars and, and you invest in Turkish lira, or, or Indonesian rupiah, or 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 or, or Chinese uh, the, the yuan, you, and as a result, for example, some place that has done fairly well since Lehman has been Turkey. Surprise. Everybody's surprised. Well, you shouldn't be surprised because the money supply has been growing at a, at a fairly hefty pace in Turkey. So let's say that on the 20% of state money, uh, let's just say for, for argument's sake that I'm right, that after Japan, Europe, and the U.S. all cut to zero, that the carry trade is long in the tooth. Now what happens if the carry trade is indeed quite illiquid? 
So in other words, if you look at oil futures or if you look at you know, Turkish equities, or if you look at anything for that matter, to your point, you know, that's basically what people did. They, you know, they, they did that in, in a very big way and actually made a lot of money on it. Uh, at, at what point does confidence in this entire plan or experiment come into play and you only get deflation of those carry trades or deflation in asset prices? Well, I, th I think eventually the carry trades, the, the hot money went out and the hot m uh, 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 of the of the uh, Europe, uh, Japan, and the United States, and and as soon as confidence erodes, you mentioned the word confidence, which is critical. As soon as confidence erodes, and we we kind of hit a tipping point in that aspect, the the hot money that went into these developing countries will go out. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll have a very chaotic situation in a, in a place like Turkey or even Indonesia. That, that hot money will, will go out just as fast as it, as it went well, in. It's interesting that like, if you look at that in U.S. dollar terms, for example, so we're, once you get everyone to zero and they have to redefine that zero plus zero equals something greater than zero, uh, Draghi falls under pressure, he, or at least feels like he's under pressure from the French and the Italians to devalue. He does that, and what we get is the strongest U.S. dollar move since 1997. But most people forgot that a strong dollar crushes a lot of these carry trades in emerging markets. So now you've got turmoil that develops there. That starts to break down. The Russell 2000 starts to break down. Bond yields start to sniff that out. They start to break down. And now the Fed has to turn around and devalue the dollar. Uh, how does this end, in your mind, the currency war between the Europeans? Is it just the Europeans against the US at this point, or is it really the trifecta uh, with the Japanese, or is the Chinese in play? Like, how do you think about this in terms of how that currency war ends? Uh, well, I, I don't know that I'd actually frame it. I know the currency war is popular, and that, that, uh, but I, I, I don't exactly buy into the idea that there's some kind of currency war going on, Keith. The, the, the fact of the matter is there, there, is, there is one, the world's most important price is the dollar euro rate. Mm -hmm. That's the most important price in the world. And, and unfortunately, uh, we, we had a situation in which Chairman Bernanke didn't even have the, the dollar on his radar screen or dashboard, as they call it. He had six things he was looking at, but he wasn't looking at the dollar. It was embarrassing. I mean, it's most of it, 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 and, and, and well, and, and it was a, ended up being a policy disaster, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Now we have uh, the vice chairman of the Fed, uh, Stan Fisher, actually is starting to talk about the dollar. So my my sense is that that Janet Yellen probably is putting the dollar on her dashboard, uh, unlike Bernanke. Well, it's absolutely so, on her dashboard because now she's talking about the the dollar correlation risk to the CRB index, for example, which Bernanke would have never talked. Oh, about. he didn't admit he he he. He testified in in the summer of not of uh, of two thousand and seven uh, because I, I I was testifying too that that the dollar had no effect on commodity prices. Yes. The correlations Very in markets. I mean, first of all, everyone in my world, everyone on the buy side, uh, operates and trades on quantitative algorithms that trade relative to the U.S. dollar. So U.S. dollar versus oil, U.S. dollar versus gold. U.S. dollar versus emerging markets, U.S. dollar versus everything. So I, I think that it was a convenient, in my opinion, is that it wasn't actually a mistake or, or like a, it, it, for him to not have it on his dashboard per se. It was just a, a blatant, um, I think it was a blatant masking of reality because to put it out there, he would have had to admit that the all-time high in commodity prices were his fault. The all-time high in cost of living was his fault. I think that he, it was a convenient uh, kind of omission from that dashboard. Yeah, well, I, I agree with your diagnosis completely, but and and uh, but 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 you have to remember, Bernanke was a religious inflation targeter, and during the time during the time gold was going to the moon, during the time that oil went up to one hundred and forty-seven dollars a barrel, during the time that why were we testifying in the summer of two thousand and seven? It was food prices. Yeah. Food price. Why, why do you think we had these revolts in, in the Middle East? It was food prices. And again, that, that's, again, that's where really, all this came from. Again, in 2012, and, it really was. I mean, you, and you have another revolt now in the U.S. from a 
political football perspective, I mean, this inequality wedge, we can show this you know, six ways to Sunday. I can show you how the top quintile gets paid by state money in your terms in your versus terms. the versus other three quarters of the country or the other four quintiles, however you want to look at it. Two-thirds of the country that's in a recession, two-thirds of the country even by the Fed's money, or at least by the Fed's recent papers that have had negative wage growth. I mean, you, get, you kind of screw them. So you end up in a place where we haven't had riots yet, but couldn't the downside surprise just be that consumers don't spend and that's the political, uh, the downside risk to the economic cycle is actually the political football that they're all going to have to deal with next? Well, uh, that that is a possibility, and it, and it comes in just one thing. Back to the food price thing, if I may. The reason that, that Bernanke really was off, he was looking at at the a variant of the consumer price index, and and that was very well behaved during all the time when oil and everything. It was just a little linear line, barely increasing at two percent per annum. So everything was in his world. In, in Bernanke's world. world, it was fine. But that line, Everything like, as you know, Stephen, it's important to educate people on what that line was. They've changed that line, as you know, nine times since 1996 so that you will never have inflation in that line. I mean, they're the well, owner's equivalent yeah, rent, for example, is calling a thousand people on their rotary phone and asking them about their rent. Whereas you can look up a modern day tool like Trulia or Zillow to get actual national rents, which are up 8 to 10%. Well, I, yeah, that, 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 I, I agree with that too, Keith, but we really don't have to get out in the weeds about those technicalities to know that in in general it's just wrong not to be looking at a broad yeah. range of asset prices and commodity prices to, to get a handle on what's going on in the world. And it's back to your point. Your point earlier was, was, was exactly the right one, and that is everyone is looking at the dollar rate, mm -hmm. and especially the dollar-euro rate. Yep. So, so I, I think there'll be more attention paid to try to, to stabilize the dollar euro rate, uh, whether there would ever be a formal agreement in the near term to, to stabilize it between. I, I've always advocated trying to get the thing stabilized at between about 120 and 140, and then, then we don't have all, all this. Well, the whole, um, I mean, this is where we get into the muddier stuff, and I think that, you know, currency wars, obviously, that's records and different people. It, it just helps them. Uh, put a metaphor around what's actually happening. Another way to put it is that central planners, whenever in trouble, they devalue the currency. That, that, that's what I'm saying. So there's a couple points on that, a couple questions, I guess. One, is it a bad premise to start with saying we should stabilize anything in markets when markets, as you know, are nonlinear and interconnected in many different ways than a central planner could ever get right? Um, and or B, why? If you did think that they could be stabilized, why would Draghi have the same in financial or political incentives, which may be different, than Janet Yellen? Well, I, I think I think the idea of stabilizing the the dollar euro rate, uh, it, it, there might not be the the political will to do it. You're, you're talking about you'd have to have some kind of formal treaty, you'd have to have uh, yeah. some kind of rule based system. Uh, where, where when, 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 the, when the euro got weak, the Fed would automatically intervene to buy euros right. and sell dollars and vice versa. And it, it would be a very complicated thing. But that's we're, where we're, the gold bulls would come in and say, like, uh, uh, pegging to, to gold would be that stabilization. That could be a policy. That's where some people might submit that as an idea. Yeah, that 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 would that would be a a rule based kind of target. You know, we're going to target gold and keep it keep it at such and such a rate, and and, and the main central banks would would use that or a commodity basket, shall we say? We have all, you know, everything but the river card is on the table, but the expectation for what the river card would be is pretty much on the table too, from a carry trading perspective. Okay, here you you want to you want to you want to get to the end game, how how it ends, and the an, the answer is I don't know how it's going. I don't to think end anybody either. knows. I think that's probably the first time somebody was honest about the answer. But but. <laughs> Let, let's go through a couple of things that you and I probably would agree on. We, we've got uh, what, what you and I just said, we don't know how it ends. That, that's because we've got so much regime uncertainty. That means no one knows what the big players, that means the, the political players and the central banks are going to do next. Okay, So we've got regime uncertainty. 
we've got many wars and conflicts going on, and, and these are pretty hot all over the world. We have imposed sanctions. The United States has is, is, is done the stupid thing of imposing sanctions uh, all, all, in, in a variety of ways. This is, this is a new tool. The, the Defense Department is the Defense Department, but a lot of the, the, the war strategy goes on at the Treasury Department with, the, with these sanctions are imposing on various countries. The most recent one, of course, Russia. So we're plugging up trade. We're, we're making the world more dangerous, basically, by, by imposing these sanctions. And a lot of people say, well, you know, Hank, what, what are you talking about? Sanctions have a big impact, you know. And I, and I, I just said, yes, they do have a big impact. <laughs> they gum up the works. That's the point. That's but the, point. the history is sanctions do not provide a good means by which to achieve the political goal that you want to achieve. In short, they don't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have an impact, but they don't work. And the impact for the markets is a lot of uncertainty and, and a lot of gumming up the works and, and, a, and a lot of blockage of trade, basically. I mean, these, these are restrictions on trade. And, and then you've, you've got this most recent thing, as, as oil has plunged, mm -hmm. That's also a, a property rights and an, an uncertainty problem because the oil production in the Middle East is up. It isn't down. And people say, oh, that, that's, that's what, are you, what are you talking about? I thought with all these wars and everything going on that the oil production would be done. No, it's up because it's a take the money and run scenario. If, if you don't think you're going to be in control of the oil tomorrow or next year, what do you want to do? You want to pump it as fast as you possibly can and get it out of there. So, so they are. They're dumping a lot of oil into the market and, and, and it's going lower. Now this has implications, by the way, another unsettling thing. It, it's good for a lot of people <laughs> like China who's importing oil. I, I just looked at these break-even prices recently for uh, countries that produce oil, what price they would have to have to be able to balance their budgets. Yeah. That's, that's a break-even price. Well, the price today is for Brent is about $85 a barrel. And, and for Iran and Bahrain to break even uh, and balance their budgets is about $130 a barrel. Then the, then the one the, then the 110 to, to one 125 Ecuador, Venezuela, Algeria, Nigeria, Iraq, Libya, and then Russia is about 110. So at today's price, the, these countries are all in a fiscal hole. Mm -hmm. so that, what's that mean? That means they're going to have to borrow from the international bond market or the local bond market or they're going to have to increase taxes, or they're going to have to uh, borrow from the central bank, which means more inflation, have central bank financing of these deficits. So, so you're throwing a lot of instability in there. You get a big price going down, and, and of course, it, it is somewhat dollar related. I get, that, I, I get. Just like, like I said, literally, you had the biggest move up in the dollar or since 1997. That to us was actually the biggest risk, macro risk to the market, because we felt like it would impose deflation in both uh, markets and economic expectations that people don't truly and genuinely understand. Which both you and I are accepting. We don't know how it ends. But versus where we've been for five years, I guess this is kind of a way to wrap up the, the conversation. Yeah, even if we don't know, is, isn't the answer uncertainty is bad for asset prices? As, uncertainty is very bad for it, it, It's going to end in tears if you really want to know what's going to happen. Uh, because just take, just take Ebola, for example. Now, the, now the government told us that not to worry about this and so forth, and, and you've got doctors without borders who have been over there and know what they're doing relative to the... They're, by the way, doctors without borders shuns government money and government involvement and so forth, and they know what they're doing, and they said we have a big problem mm -hmm. with, this, with this Ebola thing. The, the Centers for Disease Control, now what, did, what was the line they gave us? They, they said, oh, don't worry about anything. This is the 
a minor thing, and, it, and, and it, it, you can control it in any emergency room in the United States. Well, that's baloney, and they, they've even admitted this yesterday. That's why the president stayed at the White House. This, this thing is, is bad, be, because they don't know what in the world they're doing. This is a case, this is a case of government failure, and, and there have been one case after the next of government failure and the government uh, following something up and of course they spend all their time as you implied with with Bernanke trying to cover things up you know never admitting that they've been now they've been caught out on this Ebola thing we were were involved in in in, in these sanctions things well I, guess, I mean that's really we're like, involved in the it's uh, involved in all these wars and everything and that's why I say it has to end in tears, Keith. There, there's no question about it. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I've loved uh, your research for a very long time, and it was a real uh, pleasure to watch, uh, watch you here right in front of me, telling, telling it to me in person. Thanks for taking the time. Well, th thanks for having me. Good to be with you, Keith. He's Professor Steve Hanke from Johns Hopkins University, and I'm Keith McCullough. At Keith McCullough is my Twitter handle, and this was a real conversation.